Kind of like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I'd like to introduce Tom Johnson. Tom's going to do the missing man POW. Here, and he'll explain what it's about. Yeah. This is uh, an American Legion thing. I am the commander of uh, Post 83 Clinton, the American Legion. And uh, at this time, I will uh, read uh, our resolution 288, adopted at the 67th National Convention, calls for designating a POW MIA empty chair at all official meetings of the American Legion as a physical symbol of the thousands of American POW MIA still unaccounted for from World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and other conflicts. Accordingly, at this time, the Vice Commander will place the POW MIA flag on the empty chair. A reminder for all of us to spare no effort to secure the release of any American prisoners from captivity. The repatriation of the remains of those who died bravely in defense of liberty and the full accounting of those missing. Let us rededicate ourselves to this vital endeavor. I will place the flight in the Tom. Okay, my turn. Okay, now it's my turn. <laughs> my name is uh, Max Smith, for all you guys that knew me out here, alias the hooligan. I had the pleasure of growing up here in Bonner as a kid. Back in those days when I first came to Bonner, it was, like I've said before, it was kind of a Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn environment. Lots of fun. But in the back of all of our minds was the fact that someday we're going to have to step up to the plate. And all of us here, I think, can identify with that and do service to our country, either in answering to the draft or in the volunteer. So when it first was driven home to me about the military service was I saw a lefty here a long time ago. I won't, I won't come up with the same with the dates, but it was about Korea. <clears throat> Lefty was out of the service, and uh, I looked at that and I thought, man, I'm close. Another five years, Lefty's out, but I'm going to have to think about going in. So, kind of put it off out of my mind for a while, and uh, then the years went fast. By golly, here, here I'm looking at, damn, it's getting to be close to 1960 now. It's time for me to do something. One of my good friends, I want to pay tribute to him right now. He's unable to be with us. His name was Ike Olson. He served aboard the USS Talamano. We lost Ike here last summer. And I know he would be here with us if he could. And Ike was a good friend of mine. We grew up together. Some of the mischief we didn't get into, 
or something else. So from that point on, it uh, became evident to me that uh, I'm going to have to join up. So today we want to gather everyone here uh, to kind of to reminisce on what you've done. Uh, Chuck Erickson here is going to uh, assist me and uh, where I'm going to take off now is it's time for me to enlist. So the Montana Army National Guard looked about the best option that I had for to do what I wanted. What I wanted was to keep my male seniority intact, keep a good job, but yet still fulfill my military obligations. So I joined the 154th Field Artillery here at Fort Missoula. And the next thing you know, I'm on a train heading for California. <laughs> Fort Ord. Anybody remember Fort Ord? You hey, do you remember that? <laughs> Lefty, was you at Fort Ord? I was in Fort Ord all there four days. That was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Pneumonia Gulch. So, when I got to Fort Ord, the first stop was a reception center. And of course, that reception center, that was something else. I come from this Huckleberry Finn Tom Sawyer environment into the military. Okay, now out here, the start of each one of our mill days started with a big blast from that mill whistle. Remember that? That thing sounded like a whistle on a Titanic. It started our days and it ended our work day. So I didn't realize how much I missed that old whistle until I heard Reveille for the first time. And this Sergeant Aiken, drill sergeant, come in and <laughs> he had no use for us. In fact, he stated, hell, I served in the, I served in this man's army when Washington crossed the Delaware. And he says, in all my experience, I have never seen a bigger collection of mamas boys in my life. I don't know whether we can make anything out of you guys or not. So from, from that point on, I oh, what have I done? <laughs> Reception station led to getting our clothes and uh, getting our haircuts, getting our shots, and all that paraphernalia that went with it. The haircuts, classic. We had three lines, three barbers with that group that I was in. We had one lady barber, was a very attractive redhead. And all these civilians out there are killing each other to get in her line to get the haircut. And she was concerned about us. She says, how would you like your hair? Full on the sides, on the top? How do you want it? They would explain to her, and then, boy, she'd fire up this thing, look like she's sheep with. Starts your forehead and right over the top, down the backside. How's that? You know, well, hell, all these beautiful compliments they paid her going in the door had a whole different flavor going out the back door. <laughs> So we got our hair cuts as tight as that damn clipper would cut, boot us out the back door, and it's time to get shots. Some of them shots they loaded up in this monstrous gun that had about six or eight shots to it. And you walked in the line and you look at that thing and, oh, what is this? You know, stick it out of your arm, pow. Here's all these shots before you knew what hits you. Some you got with the needles, but most come through this incredible gun they had. So once you get through that, it's time to get your clothes. Beautiful clothes. You know, Max Yance from downtown Missoula, man, he, he was not playing in the same park there. All they grab, what were their sizes? Too big, too little. <laughs> we got all that and we got through our boot camp and then of course, uh, that consisted of the rantings and ravings of the drill sergeants. I don't know why that, in, in those days, you know, they'd get right in your face and scream at you and, uh, you know, like I say, old Sergeant Aiken, he, say, he would state, I've never seen a more despicable bunch of mama's boys in my life. I don't know how I'm gonna make anything out of you, but we got through it. The marching was, was incredible. Everywhere we went, we had to march and, uh, but uh, once we got through that, uh, I was assigned to a uh, boot camp, a uh, training company, 250 of us. It was uh, Company D, 9th Battle Group, 3rd Brigade. And from there, we learned all uh, everything that goes with, this, with the Army. 
So for eight weeks, we learned all these neat traits, you know, how to throw a hand grenade at somebody, how to shoot a United States rifle caliber 30 M1 gas operated clip fed semi automatic shoulder weapon. You know, you couldn't call it a rifle, and that's what the bomber's voice did. So, anyway, that was that kind of environment. We got through all that, and uh, I went into a communications company after that, learned to be a field communications crewman. And then upon completing all that, I came back here to Missoula, and I see one of my fellow guardsmen right here, Lee, Lee Legren. We were in 154 together. You were in Boulder Pool. I was in uh, field communications. So we finished out our, our tours here. <coughs> our tours consisted of uh, more of a state level. We were federal. And the only thing that got me a little bit nervous was when uh, President Kennedy and Mr. Khrushchev were hooping it up over putting missiles in Cuba. It got to the point where we loaded up. We were loaded out here at uh, the depot and ready to go before this thing cooled down. And of course, nuclear warfare is... It's been a long time since I had to deal with something like that. The lefty's more versed on this than I am, but it is something that nobody, no matter how stupid they are, would want to engage in. You know, hopefully we'd never come to that. But after that, after uh, President Kennedy and Khrushchev kind of cooled their heels, the only civilian activities we had for the state of Montana, uh, that outfit that I was in, the 154th, was one of the units called on to put a lid on the prison riot over here. And then the next call we got, and this, this scared me spitless, if the Russians would lob a missile at us, we were supposed to meet at Evero Hill. That was our primary assembly area. Got a call one night. My wife told me, go to Evero Hill. I thought, oh no, here we go. <coughs> got up there, and it was the MP Railroad passenger train. Had come down through there a little bit too fast and dumped that train and people all over. And we had to police that up. Uh, we had one little girl, I think it was a fatality. Other than that, it was a colossal mess that uh, we got it straightened out. And after that, uh, after that incident, uh, the various training uh, weeks that we had with the National Guard over here in Fort Harrison uh, led me to complete my eight years obligation. And uh, Vietnam was just starting to warm up. They called it Laos then. And uh, I didn't quite buy into that, so I thought, eight years, let's take a discharge and get out before I get to that 10-year mark, and then I want to go over the hill and go for a retirement. So that's when I backed out. Not backed out, but I figured I paid my dues. Let's turn it over to the younger guys. Okay, with that, uh, I'll, I'll entertain any questions. If you don't have any, I'll sit down and, and let Chuck go at it. Uh, basically, what we want to do is we'll each take a turn, think of something interesting you've done, we'll talk about it, maybe have some laughs at the good times, and, and kind of shudder at the times that weren't so good. So, with that, I'll sit down. I'd, I'd like to start off by having everybody introduce themselves and, and tell us what branch you served in and roughly <clears throat> what, what period, what time frame. Could we start with you, Elsie? Yeah. Um, I'm Elsie Rieger, I live in Clinton, and um, I was in the Navy. Uh, I, I'm one of the truly old veterans. I served in World War II between 1943 and 1945. Well, right now. Uh, that, that will do for right now. We've got, we've got a bunch of questions for everybody, so... so we'll, I'll, we'll just... I'll be talking to you later. <laughs> <Okay. I hope. laughs> Tom? Tom Johnson, Lynn Tura, uh, United States Navy, uh, 59 to 63. I was his. <laughs> okay, then, then you're with him. Yeah. <laughs> you're with her. She's a drill sergeant. <laughs> I guess you're next, Lefty. 
Me? Okay. My hearing aids aren't turned up. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I'm an old lady and I'm lucky pleasant. I'm from Bonner. I still stand from Bonner, but I live in the school enough. Uh, I went in the Korean War right after it broke out uh, into service. I mean, uh, 1950, 52, and I was with one of those famous draftees, our whole company of draftees. And uh, I'll tell more about it later. Thank you. Okay. Korean War, 50 to 52. All right. Reserves five years, 57, I got my discharge. All right. <laughs> I'm Richard Worley, and I represent the American Legion, and the one I brought out to buy a service bike for the thing back there. But in 1963, I was age 17, a junior in high school, and enlisted in the Montana Army National Guard right out here in Fort Missoula. Went to Fort Ord in 1964 from July to November, and then went on to Fort Lewis for two months, I guess it was. But I served 41 years in the Montana Army National Guard. I worked full time for the Army National Guard as a civil service employee for 33 years, right at Fort Missoula. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know everybody's name here. <laughs> My name is Herb Grail, and I was in the service in 1945 46. I was in Korea here to the day, and I got out of there just about the time that they were talking about having problems. So the uh, army set up 30 caliber and water, water cooled machine guns on top of building and building to protect them. That was because there was talk about it trouble. So I got out of there before the trouble started. Dave? Dave Waddle started in Pilksville, now I live in Tura. I'm in the Army, RA 19880827. And uh, is it from the fall of 65 to the fall of 69? Okay. Let's see. Mike Armstrong, I sort of got drafted in 72. I'm going to stay and make a career, but they made me, in their infinite wisdom, made me an Army recruiter. They wouldn't let me go back to the real Army. I got out. I was in the Army, took my training at Camp Roberts. Then I went to Berlin, Germany. I figured I was the backbone of the army. I was a cook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can start up. <clears throat> Excuse me, we can start up here. Frank, now. you want Frank. to give her a shot? Yeah. Uh, United States Navy. I uh, was in the reserve from 62 to 68. My active duty time was uh, 64 to 66 in Vietnam. And. Uh, I live at her. I guess that's all we want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's your turn. Uh, Lee, Lee Leggard, uh, I was in the 154th, the same one that Max Smith was in, 60 to 64, and I had uh, 42 years in the sawmill stuff. And uh, me, and, me and Mac, we were born, born the same day. Ten years, same day, so I kind of uh, how it's how it come around here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, poor old geezers. Got it. Oh, got Rick Swanson, we got to get you to say something. <laughs> I just came in. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, what did you do at we Uncle just... Sam's Armed Forces? What did I do? Yep. <laughs> I heard you can still fit your uniform. The only thing in my uniform fits is my socks. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, was going to a 90th birthday party, so I didn't figure I was going to wear my uniform there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the only thing, 
Is this it? You're on. You're on. Oh. That's close. <laughs> well, I tell you what I did. I uh, went to see it was in December of 51. I was in downtown and a bunch of us got together and we enlisted in the Air Force. And that was December 3rd. On December 7th, 1951, I was sworn in into the Air Force. From there, I went on the uh, train to Texas, Lackland Air Force Base. On the way down, there was a major sitting in the compartment and uh, he, we got to talking to him and uh, he took our names. It was five of us from Montana. And uh, he says, I uh, am at the Air Defense Command in Colorado. And he took all our names and uh, it was kind of funny, but I'll get to that later. And uh, he got off in Colorado and we went to Texas, went through Basin, and uh, we got assigned, all five of us got assigned to Colorado Springs at the Air Defense Command. Now, if that was his doing, I don't know, but uh, that's where I ended up, and I was there for 18 months, and then I went to uh, Germany, went over on the... USS General Patch, which was a troop ship. And uh, from there, I, we landed in Bremerhaven. And from there, I went to, uh, let's see, Bitburg. And from Bitburg to Prum, which was a radar site between Luxembourg and Belgium. And I was what they called a scope. I watched the radar scope going round and round. And uh, from there I went to Regensburg, which was a detachment uh, of, of the uh, wing that I was at in uh, 615th ACW squadron. And that was uh, headquartered at Prune, and then we went to Regensburg, which was just north of Munich. And from from there, I went on another detachment up to three, which was in Durham, just north of Cologne and Aachen. And uh, in Regensburg, we could sit there and on our scope and watch the Russian planes take off of, over at Pilsen and watch how they were flying around. And uh, after the my time was up, I went to Frankfurt. From there, I flew home. And uh, I was discharged in 55, in December. So, that's my story. Okay, <laughs> all right, great. <coughs> Elsie. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did I do with it? <laughs> I hope this won't take too much of your time, but I didn't want to take my scrapbook apart. <laughs> I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. <laughs> um, first of all, I'll have these things out. Oh, I can't Mike. hold that. Do you want to hold that for me? Sure. Um, this is just the, uh, when I was in San Diego at the uh, Naval Air Base out on North Island. Um, they took pictures of everybody in, on base. And so my picture's in here, right there. All right. So you can all <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I'll put them out there where you can go through them. Um, There I am. <laughs> I had a hard time finding a picture of myself. I don't know, I didn't 
just to get me pictures. This is when our, the first platoon I was assigned to, and that was at Hunter's College in New York. When I, this is when our platoon finished our boot, or indoctrination, it wasn't boot camp yet. Now, you can see that later. And then there's pictures of myself and my older brother, and he was in the Air Force and flew over Cologne and bombed over there from England. And this is a, just an information book. Um, and it's, I'd like to read just a little bit from the introduction, which was by the Admiral of the base. Few people realize what a tremendous part was played by the young women of our country in the ultimate victory over the forces arrayed against us. As Assistant Chief of Naval Personnel during the period in which the WAVE organization was formed and having been, so to speak, in attendance upon its early growing pains, it gives me great pleasure to add these few words to the preface of this book. And he's talking about how women hadn't been elevated, expected to be, or do anything except just maintain a home and whatever. So he says, let him who says these things see how they took the place of men in almost every phase of fighting and man's career, with the single exception of actual combat, and performed their tasks often even better than the men they replaced. <laughs> so we had, <laughs> Great. we set the standard then. Um, as I said, you be able to go through this and see pictures. Um, this is one of our reviews. Everybody had to form into their platoons and stand at attention for several hours, which all of you have done. <laughs> Um, this is boot training in New York City. So we, we walked many a mile in the rain, in the snow, whatever. Uh, when I was in North Island, I often got to go out to the wharfs and go on board some of the fighting battleships that returned. One of them that I went on was the Hornet. It was quite that badly damaged, but they had put um, steel plates over the damage to bring it back into the United States. And uh, we stood colors on many of the battleships. <sighs> Then when I was in boot training in, in uh, New York on uh, May Day of 1942, we, had to, we were in a parade down Fifth Avenue in New York. And I couldn't swear where in the multitudes of, of people there, I think there was 80,000 in the parade, so I was in there somewhere. That's all I can tell you. Um, what happened to my little pieces of paper? These are Yeah, there they are, right under my nose. <laughs> um, WAVES is an acronym for um, women accepted for voluntary service, emergency service. So, um, um, one thing uh, that we learned was the Navy song. I don't know what page it is. This uh, Navy song was sung while we were drilling if we were just passing time, whatever, and it was sung in a counterpoint to the anchors away. Maybe you'll have to hear that later. <laughs> I can't find it. 
Nope. Well, we'll get. Um, the women were organized to um, release men for sea duty. And the first waves recorded for duty on November 1942. In February 1943, boot training was um, set at Hunter's College, and that, of course, where I was. 1945, on BJ Day, there were 86,000 women serving in the Navy, and when they were demilitarized. I was working for Spokane at the Spokane um, Airfield. It was Army, and I worked in the paint shop. And I had exposure, of course, to some airplanes at that time because we were putting not only painting numbers on B-17 tails or something like that, and also on putting dope on trainers. <coughs> Trainers were made with, um, these didn't never left the ground. These are just training <laughs> on points of how you're going to fly this airplane. So um, they were just canvas, stretched over frames, and it was our job to paint the dope on them. Wasn't that exciting? <laughs> um, um, as been mentioned, personnel had to, had no other uh, transportation other than trains, passenger trains. So we were just piled in. You had to go and find a seat wherever, and there were no uh, sleeping accommodations or anything. And we were traveling from Spokane to Hunter's, um, okay. to the boot train. And, um, Several, spent several nights on the train, whatever. I often had sailor, or soldiers, because we didn't have sailors on these particular uh, travels, but the um, soldiers thought nothing of laying their head over on the shoulder and taking their snoozes. <laughs> um, that's something you guys can't say. <laughs> um, when uh, we got into New York, we were, of course, entering into the subway systems. And so there was a, a naval officer there that was corralling all the gals that were picked up all the way along from Spokane through wherever the train went. And we ended up there in, in a subway station in New York. And so she was gathering uh, this train load of new recruits. And she said, now hold hands. And she said, don't let go. Otherwise, you're going to find these New Yorkers will just crash through your line and you get lost. We break the line. There was too many civilians charging down through the station, and she didn't want to lose anybody. <laughs> New York. <laughs> um, uh, from the uh, train, we were bused to Hunter's College and uh, were assigned to rooms. And I was in a dorm and on the fifth floor. And they very quickly assured us there's no elevator service. So, um, and we were told we had one minute whenever we were notified by a whistle to um, muster down on the street. You had one minute. Well, that was pretty hard to take when you're on the fifth floor. But we did it, and I said, the Navy really started um, conditioning us early. It sounds like it. <laughs> um, well, I already covered that. Okay. Um, Um, when uh, I was in um, New York, I had some leave, and I was able to take tourist tours around as much as possible. 
And one time, uh, some friends and I were going to go down to the pier and go out to the Statue of Liberty. And we were confused, and a young gal came up and she says, where are you going? She says, I'm a New Yorker, I can tell you which ferry to take. So we thought, oh boy, we really fell in good here. And she told us which ferry. We got on it, it pulled out into the waters, and then we found out we weren't on the right ferry. <laughs> well, we went past the, the statue, but we just had a nice ferry ride. We didn't get to go off onto the, to see <laughs> the actual statue. Um, Um, upon finishing boot training, we were assigned to our training school, and uh, it was determined that I was mechanically inclined, and I was an old farm girl. I, um, I spent some years in Illinois where my father had corn farm, and uh, we had some cattle, not very many, but um, I was a farm girl, and you learn to do a whole lot of things when you're a farm girl. So anyhow, the Navy found out I was pretty well um, mechanically inclined, and so I was sent to the Aero Instrument School, and that was in Chicago. Um, and again, I traveled by train. My parents lived 100 miles south of Chicago, and on um, one of the leaves I had, uh, two other girls and I were just out looking down around the loop area, see what we could find in Chicago. We didn't have many much time off, but that's where we were going to see what Chicago had to offer. And all of a sudden, a car pulled up beside us, and who was there but my parents. <laughs> they didn't know I had leave. I didn't know they were coming into Chicago. And my mother had been looking at every wave she saw on the street to see if, was that Elsie? Well, she finally found me. <laughs> they took us out to dinner and we had a wonderful evening uh, with my folks. Um, I put on here, what's the odds of that happening? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Upon uh, completion of the training at the uh, instrument school, we were broken up again. It didn't seem like we were going to ever stay with the same people. And, um, and I was sent to San Diego <coughs> Air Station on North Island. And we were buried in new buildings that they hadn't even completed yet. And so every so often, a man was coming in to do some work there, and he'd say, man on board! <laughs> so we had to scurry and cover up if we hadn't been in the shower or whatever. <laughs> and uh, that, oh, thankfully, didn't carry on too long. Uh, during the short time that we had uh, with that, we had to eat in the office's mess. Wasn't that terrible? We had to eat with what the officers ate. So we had <laughs> crab cakes and lobster tails. And oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So we ate well for a little bit until they finally got um, the mess in line for the waves. And then uh, when we first got in the service, uh, we didn't wear these hats. We had crowns and brims. And um, so when we would go in to, ha to the mess, we always checked to see if our bowl was clean before they put soup or something in it. And uh, we had to be careful. If we were marching in the rain and came in to eat and we dumped our heads down, we put all that water that was caught in our hat rims in the bowl. No place to throw it away. <laughs> Um, and let me see. when we left the um, training school, we got our um, ratings and, and came out with the AMMI 3C, Merit 
aviation, mechanics, mate, and they stuck on instruments. They didn't have another place to put it. So we had to explain that pretty hard. And one time, um, oh, some months later, we, were, we had to take launches from the mainland to the island and back. So we were, my friends and I were in a launch going into San Diego. And my friend got into an argument with a sailor. He didn't like our wearing the AMMI patch on our sleeve. And she was trying to tell him, we earned it. You know, it wasn't just a given. She said, you know, we not only had to know what's in your AMMI test, but instruments too. And he didn't have a response to that. Um, uh, to get your new ratings, we had to go and sit with the sailors when they took tests for the, if they wanted to try for an increase in their rates. So we took exactly the same tests the boys did. <coughs> And when the results were available, a friend of mine said she's going to go down to where they had the results and see if she'd pass so she'd get her increase in rating. I said, well, check for me. She came back and she said, your name was highest on the list. Cool. Show those boys something. <laughs> right? It's exciting. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, I got two. <laughs> um, at one time, while I was working there in the instrument department, they called and came by and said, we want to take you into the camera department, that's aerial cameras. And uh, so I did. And the instructor there had the parts for a camera lens on the table. You know, these cameras were big like that. And uh, so he designated what each piece was, what it did, what its name was, where it went in the, in the assembly and so forth. And when he got done, then he asked, if I could repeat what he said so that to see if I remembered or caught what he was saying. I went through it just like he gave it to me and he says, by God, he says, you do better than the men. So we were able. Um, and I never knew why, but in that department, they had a few Russian sailors. I don't know what they were there for, and you know, you don't ask questions. Um, and when I was um, selected to be, a, well, that isn't quite the right word. Anyhow, I was a POW, and before you decide that was what we now say POWs are, this was Petty Officer of the Watch. And we had to, we wore an air, uh, armband with those initials on it, and then we had, would be assigned special duties like um, uh, parole, patrol, the uh, area around the barracks at night, but we only went by ourselves. And we had no Billy Club or anything, I mean, it was just us going around to see if everything was calm and quiet. And I often think about that because you couldn't do that today. You wouldn't dare. So we had lots of respect from the sailors. And one time I went to a movie in a big auditorium. We had all our amusements and whatever with the sailors. So this was a big auditorium. All of a sudden, they stopped the reels, turned up the lights, and they stood up and they said, is Elsie Scamahorn here? And of course, I 
Yes, I was. Well, I had missed signing in that I was on duty there that night. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, I had to go to Patton's Mast and explain why I wasn't on duty as I should have been. That's where my POW tape got me. <laughs> um, I enjoyed many, many experiences and opportunities to see and do new things and to step into Mexico from San Diego and go in onto the decks of our fighting ships and stand colors with the sailors and to visit world famous aquariums, and zoos and planetariums and uh, even went to where the stars had, uh, movie stars had the uh, their names on the sidewalk in LA. So that was special. And we went to a French restaurant, amusement park with a double decker. Boy, you were really up in the air with that. I have seen both oceans, crossed both borders, and much of the ugly America in between them. <laughs> and <clears throat> To have mingled with people from everywhere is an unbelievable experience. Excuse me. <laughs> I, thought I, I didn't think I was going to get so emotional. <laughs> done great. And this stuff will be out there so you can see other things that I haven't got time to mention to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to introduce myself. I'm Chuck Erickson. I served in the Navy 68 to 71 as a Navy diver in, uh, on Guam on a nuke subtender for 19 months and 10 days and then Vietnam for a year. Uh, I went back into the reserves after that, so I did 12 years total. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Stan Cohen, who came out today uh, to give us a little background history on some of the Missoula and Bonner area mil mil military. Stan's a native of West Virginia, a 61 graduate of West Virginia University, degree in geology. Been a resident of Missoula since 61 and has been a consulting geologist, engaged in, been engaged in the ski business, involved in various local museums through the years, including the Museum of Mountain Flying. He's owned Pictorial History Publishing Company since 76. Stan's authored uh, author co-authored 71 books and published 300 and that's that's the count I got which is probably way off yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah 2003 Stan co-authored a book they came to destroy America the FBI goes to war against Nazi spies and saboteurs before and during World War II which includes the story of Kurt Frederick Ludwig who was in Missoula at the time for a time. And with that, I'll let Stan take over. Well, thank you. Oops. Just about up here. Um, I don't know how much time I got. I could spend all day here, but I'll go through this quickly. Uh, just a couple things before I get into two items, if we have time. Okay. Um, I'm from. Uh, Charleston, West Virginia. Our most famous military person was the grandfather of George S. Patton, he was a lawyer and a colonel in the Confederate Army. Our section of West Virginia, thank the Lord, it was all Confederate. And uh, uh, Chuck Yeager grew up just down the road from where I grew up, so we have two famous people, more than that even, that uh, were from my home area. Um, I've been out here since 61. I've actually just finished my 84th book and about 360 published. I kind of lost track of them. Some of them I'd like to lose track of too. So, so anyhow, uh, I was going to talk about two different things that had to do with Missoula, if I have time. Um, 
And if I start getting too winded, just cut me off. <laughs> uh, even before that, too, uh, I started in the, and unfortunately, I'm only a two year veteran of ROTC. Um, I never went in the regular military. I tried to get in naval OCS, but I flunked mental and physical tests. <laughs> Haven't been right since, I guess. <laughs> uh, but during my book career, which started in 76 with Civil War books, because I grew up in Civil War country, I've actually had the experience of being going all over the world. Uh, I spent time with the Fijian Army when they went to the Sinai Desert in Egypt, flew with them back and forth from Hawaii clear to Singapore. I didn't go to Fiji and went to Fiji. I uh, published a book for a famous Luftwaffe pilot. Uh, been to his reunion four times in northern Germany. The last one is in Berlin, which is real interesting because I got to meet two East German and two West German pilots. Of course, by that time, they'd all consolidated into the Bundeswehr. Um, I've been all over Europe, all the battlefields. Um, I wrote a book in Wake Island, been out there three times, which ain't easy to get to. I've uh, been to Kwajalein, Pan Am flew me to the Philippines twice, been through Corregidor, went through the tunnel where the MacArthur headquarters were, stood on the deck where he took off from when he escaped from Corregidor. Um, I have spent uh, this will be my 30th year with the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders, and one of them lives right here in Missoula, David Thatcher. Uh, our last reunion is in Fort Walton Beach, Florida in April. Going to those reunions, I've met uh, many famous people, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Cliff Robertson, who played Kennedy in PT-109, Ernie Borgnine, just a whole bunch of Hollywood stars. They all knew do Jimmy Doolittle who I think was the greatest aviator ever existed, even higher than Lindbergh, who also has a big connection here in, in uh, Missoula area. So it's been a, and I've been to, honestly, probably more military reunions than anybody in history since I've done so many World War II books. I got them all out there, by the way, if anybody wants to look at them after, afterwards. So, not to prolong this, um, I got two, two stories. Maybe I'll do the short one first, and then if I run out of time, I won't do the long one. But uh, in the two stories that I'll just tell you about, one of them is about Missoula's major ace during World War II, Hubert Hub Zemke. Has anybody not heard of Zemke? He is extremely famous if you're into World War II stories, but if you're not, uh, we have a big deal out at the military museum or the flying museum on him. I have people from Missoula come out there and have never heard of him, which I think is a crime because he is so well known in flying circles during World War II and ace being an ace. The other thing I'll talk about if I have time. I wrote a book on the <clears throat> German uh, intrusions in the U.S. during World War II. Uh, there were only three of them. Uh, two of them were called Ap Operation Pastorius, which was in June of 42. Gary and Judy bought my book, so if I say anything wrong, you correct me. The other intrusion was in uh, Bangor, Maine, that area. And two spies landed in 1944. That's the only two uh, enemy people that have landed on the west east coast during World War II. There were no landings of Japanese on the west coast. However, there were several bombings by submarines. One at Goleta, California. They uh, tried to destroy an oil refinery and just made a big hole in the ground. They bombed, uh, shell, not bombed, they shelled Fort Stevens right up towards the Columbia River in Oregon. 
and they uh, fired a few shells in Vancouver Island, BC. <clears throat> they sent one plane over the Northwest in Oregon, I think it was Oregon or Washington, one airplane off a submarine trying to start forest fires. Now, and you all know about the balloon bombs that came over, but those were not human, those were bombs, or balloons, trying to set forest fires. And, and a bunch of them landed in Montana, went clear to, to Michigan. Unfortunately, uh, they sent them to the wrong time of the year to start forest fires, but they were in retaliation to the Doolittle Tokyo Raid, which our resident Dave Thatcher uh, was on, on the raid. He lives on, in Missoula. He's 90, 91 now. There's, there's five left, and he's one of the five. He's the youngest. So I, let me talk just a few minutes about uh, Hub's Empty, and then if we have time, I'll give you the short version of the two German spies here in Missoula. And this is Hub's Empty. I'm going to read just a little bit about this, and I got this off of Waipakea, is that how you pronounce it? And the one thing you never want to believe is Waipakea, which I think is pretty well known. It gives you most of the facts, but they don't get them all exactly right. But anyhow, this will give you a real quick overview of Zemke, and I'll just kind of go through it. Colonel Hubert Hub Zemke was born in 1914 here in Missoula. He was a career officer in the United States Air Force, a fighter pilot in World War II, and a leading uh, Air Force ace. Jimmy, uh, General Jimmy Doolittle, and this is saying a lot, <clears throat> praised Zemke as his greatest fighter group commander. He recommended, he, he commanded the 5th 56th Fighter Group in England, which came to be known as Zemke's Wolf Pack. So Zemke's parents were German immigrants. Uh, don't know why they landed in Missoula. His dad worked for the railroad. Zemke was born in 1914. He went to Missoula County High School. Uh, here in Waikia, it says, <clears throat> He had no intention of flying. He intended to pursue a degree in forestry at Montana State University on football and boxing scholarships. He instead attended the University of Montana where he was a member of Sigma Nu fraternity. His, uh, think about this. <clears throat> when he uh, was going to out here, it was called Montana State University. <clears throat> It's now the University of Montana. So Waipakea right there is thinking he went to two different schools when he only went to the same school. So you gotta be real cautious what they say in, for anything in this because these are amateurs writing all this stuff. But it gives you a start anyway. And just to go through real quick, uh, he played for Missoula County High School. He was a boxing champion because when he was growing up, it was after World War I, and Germans were not very well welcome any place in the U.S., even after the war. He got bullied, so he learned how to box. So he went to UM, or it was MSU at the time, and uh, played football. But he quit to join the Air Corps in 1935, so he never finished college. So let me go over here real quick. Oh, I know it all by heart anyway. So you learned how to fly. Remember this was pre-war. In 1940, he was sent to England as an observer with the Royal Air Force during the, uh, uh, the Blitz in England to see how the English and the Germans were fighting each other. In 1941, which I don't know if it was before or after December 7th, well, it would have been after, before December 7th, 
they sent him to Russia to teach the Russians how to fly Linley's P-40s, which was the Tomahawk. Now, that was our main fighter plane at that time. <clears throat> so once we got into the war in December, uh, right after that in February, he, uh, he wanted to come back and join the U.S. Air Force and do his duty. So he came back through Iran, Egypt, clear across Africa, clear across the, to uh, South America, came up and uh, joined the regular U.S. Air, Air Corps. It's actually called the U.S. Army Air Forces at the time. Uh, he flew P-47 Thunderbolts, which was, as far as I know, the biggest Air Force fighter pilot or fighter plane built during the war. Uh, we have at the Flying Museum, as far as I know, the largest single-engine airplane, U.S. airplane, maybe world airplane built during the war, which is the TBM torpedo bomber called the Avenger, which we bought last October, if you'll remember from the newspaper. There's a fire bomber with Johnson Fine Service. We brought it back, and it's in our hangar now. And it's huge. It's a carrier plane. So Zemke eventually became head of the 56th Fighter Group of the 8th Air Force. And remember that the 8th Air Force didn't really get to Europe till months after Pearl Harbor. And they were the main fighting or air force that bombed Germany throughout the, the, the war. So Zemke became the commander, uh, which became the top uh, kill group of the 8th Air Force. It had the top uh, ace, Francis Grabeski, who had 56 kills. And when I say kills, it's not a derogatory word, it's shoot downs. Uh, Zemke ended up with 19 and a half. In this, they say 17 and a half. Um, so I don't believe this at all. And anybody that reads this does get a little bit of misinformation. So anyhow, uh, he became the commander. Uh, they shot down more enemy planes than any other group uh, once we started uh, escorting bombers to bomb Europe, eventually to Berlin. And uh, they had more than one ace. Zemke, as I said, had 19 and a half. If you know anything about World War II fighters, the Germans, the top German ace was Eric Hartmann, who had, if I remember right, over 350. But think about this. Uh, they fought from day one to they either got shot down, killed, or captured or to the end of the war. Hartman lasted to the end of the war and then got captured by the Russians. They didn't have any of this rotation back to the States with huge manpower. They had to keep going. And that's why all the German aces, all the top ones, were way above what we had because we always rotated them back at some point in time. But Grubeski had 56, which was a lot. Uh, Richard Bong actually had no, Bong was the leading ace, excuse me. Richard Bong with P-38 was the leading ace in the war with 56. Grubeski, I think, was second, but he was in the 56 fighter group. So to make a long story short, um, they escorted the uh, bombers with P-47s, but P-47s had a short range. They had some uh, complications with fighting uh, German uh, 109 Messerschmitts and Falk Wolfs. Eventually, uh, uh, this was, Zemke uh, was brought back to the U.S. for a while. Then he went back to Europe and took over the 479th Fighter Group, and they had transitioned to P-51s. And if any of you have watched the Military Channel, they were called the Little Friends. 
because they could escort bombers from England clear to Berlin and back. And they basically saved the 8th Air Force from just being destroyed. <clears throat> Zemke was supposedly credited with the first shoot down of an ME-263, the first jet. Jaeger, Chuck Yeager, again from my hometown, or near my hometown, uh, was also credited with shooting down one of the first 262s. By the way, just as a sideline, and I, again, I don't want to take up all this the whole time, <clears throat> there were two fighter pilots. Once you were shot down over Europe and you made it back, either escaping or however you got back to England, which didn't happen very often, you were not supposed to fly over Europe again. And the reason being is, if you got shot down the second time and captured, and you'd been helped by the resistance or whatever, they could beat it out of you. You already had it in your head how you got out the first time. And the Germans obviously had a list of who was shot down first time, and here's Jaeger back the second time. So as far as I know, only two fighter pilots were able to do that. One was Chuck Jaeger. I don't know how he did that, but he was pretty brash and bold, and I, he talked somebody into letting him fly back. After he got shot down, escaped, he never got captured, he escaped through Spain, got back to England. The other one was a man named Bob Vanderstock, who I published his book. He was a Dutch pilot, escaped to England, went back, Flew Spitfires, got shot down, got put in Stavog Luft 3, The Great Escape. Everybody has seen the movie The Great Escape. There was uh, 77 escapees out of the movie. And the movie, by the way, was total fiction. So don't believe too much of what you see in the movie. Uh, there were no Americans escaped out of the movie. They were all RAF from different nationalities, no Americans whatsoever. Americans did help dig the tunnels, the three tunnels. One of the tunnel diggers was also one of the Doolittle Raiders, Davy Jones. And But uh, only RAF got out. Uh, Seventy, this is off the subject a little bit, but it's interesting. Let's see, there were 77 that got out. All but three were captured, uh, 50 were executed, three got away. Two Norwegians and a Dutchman made it back to England. The Dutchman was named Bob Vanderstock, and I published his book in English. He wrote me one day from Honolulu and said, I'm looking for an uh, American publisher to publish my book about the Great Escape. I love escape stories. I immediately got on a plane and flew to Honolulu and made a deal with him and published his book. And uh, he escaped through Amsterdam back to England and after D-Day somehow talked the RAF into letting him fly back over Europe again, which was a no-no. Um, it was a great, one of my greatest thrills to meet somebody that was actually on the Great Escape, which is the most famous World War II escape, escape in history, although it wasn't portrayed very accurately in the movie. Remember when Steve McQueen got on the motorcycle? He only would play in the movie if he could ride a motorcycle. Well, there were no motorcycle escapees in the movie, but they let him do that just so he could be in the movie. Again, remember James Gardner was one of the escapees, an American. Let's say again, no, nobody escaped, no American escaped. But they did escape. Uh, so uh, Zimke, and in, in, in this, it said that he was in 1944, he hit turbulence and a wing came off his P 51. Now, I heard that he ran out of gas, so I'm not so sure exactly, and without reading his book again, exactly how he crashed, but he crashed 
and he was captured. And he was sent to Stargard Luft 1, which was on the Baltic Sea, which was another famous POW camp. <clears throat> and this was in 44, so things are going pretty bad for the, Ger uh, for the Germans. So towards the end of the war, the Russians obviously were coming west, and they were approaching the Stavogs in Germany. So the Germans, the uh, Luftwaffe, decided to move all the Allied prisoners on what was called the Long March to a place called Moosburg down near Nuremberg. And they had a march by foot. <coughs> and this was in January. And this was a very, very difficult thing to do. <clears throat> but Zimke talked to German commanders of Stavrog Luft I, where he was. Remember, he spoke German fluently because his parents were German. He also spoke some Ger uh, Russian because he was in Russia. He talked to Germ the Luftwaffe and saying, leave these guys here. They're going to die if they go. The Russians are just down the street here. Just let the Russians take over the Allied prisoners. And the Germans could see the handwriting on the wall, and uh, they skedaddled in the middle of the night. So the Russians liberated the camp and saved 9,000 lives. Zimke basically saved 9,000 lives. If he didn't do anything else in the war, that was his great achievement. So uh, at the end of the war, he stayed in the military. Uh, he was kind of a, a little bit of a rogue, so he didn't get pushed up. He should have been a general. But, so he didn't get elevated as much as he should have, but he ended up uh, staying in until 19, let's see, I wrote that down someplace here. I think 19, he retired in 1966, and he moved to uh, near Reno and went in the nut business. Well, he was in the nut business all through the war anyway, so. <laughs> but uh, I can't remember what kind of nuts he, pistachio nuts, I believe. He had a farm there. I met him one time. He came up to one of the gun shows here because he was dealing in pistol grip, wooden pistol grips. And I was lucky enough to meet him, get my picture taken with him. And uh, I tried to get, he died in 19... 94. So he was 80 years old. I talked to his son one time who lives in Reno. And at the time, his son, I don't know if he invented him or ran the Hexel Ski Company. Dennis will recognize that. I used to sell them in my ski shop. So he was in a ski bit. His son was. I'm going to try, if possible, to get his son to come up here this summer if he would to give a talk about his dad, because his dad needs more recognition than what he's got. So that's the story of Hub Zimke. Any questions on Mr. Zimke? So at least everybody here knows who Hub, 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 Hubert Hub. He was named Hub because he was a fighter, and he just got the nickname of Hub because he was golden gloves and all that. He was, as far as I know, and you had to be have five kills to be an ace. And uh, I don't know if there was any other, I don't think there was any other aces from Missoula. There were other aces from Montana. Speaking of aces, I published a book for a German ace. His name is Wolfgang Speta. And uh, there was another deal where he was looking for a, a U.S. publisher to do his book, German book, in English. And the minute I got a letter from him, I flew to Hamburg, Germany, and met with him and made a deal, and I published his book called Top Secret Bird. He was in charge of developing the ME-263, or excuse me, 163, which was the first rocket plane. You sat on a rocket, and uh, so I published this book, and then he invited me to come to his 
first reunion in Bajfischnam, Germany. And this was a very, very dangerous plane. Uh, it got in late in the war. I should have brought, you know, I have a model of it. I wish I'd have brought it. It was the fastest plane developed, one of the fastest planes developed in the war. It was a rocket plane. It, it, its fuel was hydrogen peroxide. If you exposed it to the air, it'd blow up on you. So it came in too late to really make any difference as far as bombing Germany. But I went to four of his reunions, the last one in Berlin. Just a side note, the first one I went to, they got all the whatever pilots were left in Germany, and the people that built the rocket engine and Messerschmitt built the frame. And we had about 100 people at each reunion. And at my first reunion, we were at Bajfischnam, which was the base for the, the plane during the war. And we went into a, it was a Luftwaffe base, and we went into a big dining room, big long table, about 100 people sitting along this table. And I have nothing good to say about the Nazis or anything, but I swear, I, I went in there and I thought I was in Germany in 1942 in the Luftwaffe. It just, it just, it was just weird. So I ended up going to four of the reunions, became very good friends with the pilots, actually. And, uh... Sam, I have a question. I'm, oh, yeah. I, I would just would like to get back to the Zemke family. Are they still in Missoula? Oh, no. No? No. And I don't think he had any siblings. I mean, the, the parents, I got, I got it, they both died years um, ago. No, there's nobody here at all. Well, thank you. And if you get uh, a program set up this coming summer on that, we'd be sure and let us know. We'd, I know everybody would like to oh, hear I, about that. And I do apologize. We're not going to have time to do the spy story. Oh, I, that's fine. So because uh, we have a lot of things, including your exhibit, out in oh, okay. the Narthex to look at, so maybe, Chuck, we could just go ahead and talk to a few of these other folks. Okay, and then, that's fine. Uh, Jim has provided cake, and we can have coffee and cake, and, okay. and we'll talk to you more. I'm sorry that we ran out of time. No, no, I, I could sit here all day and tell you about World War II, but that's, <laughs> I got, I'm going to Phoenix tomorrow, so i got to get ready for oh, that, too. Okay. Well, we, make everybody you know, really feel great. That wonderful <laughs> Phoenix. I'll, check, I'll send it back to you. Uh, yeah, well, I have a couple more questions for some of the people. I'd like to thank I was, I was going to run a few questions around the room because we, we've got a lot of vets from different eras and whatnot. And, and one thing that always came to mind and a lot of people ask when, when you talk to them, and yeah, I'm a veteran. Is it, and one of the first questions that comes up was always, what motivated you to go into the service and why did you pick the branch you went into? Could we, could we just have everybody really quickly run around with that one? We'll start with you. Uh, we can start with Elsie, yeah. Oh, uh, well, pay was one thing. I wasn't getting that much money working at the uh, Air Force there in Spokane. It was a little better. It wasn't great, but it was better. So I just, um, well, I have a twin sister. She was employed, and so she said, why don't you do that, Elsie? I didn't, she really convinced me that it was the thing to do. <laughs> cool. Tom? Uh, I volunteered. I just uh, wanted to serve my country and uh, wanted to get an education, so I picked out the Navy. That's about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I joined the National Guard in uh, May of 63, only thinking back before that, my cousin was in the Navy, so I just thought that would be a neat thing to do, but I joined the Explorer Scouts in 1963, of the brass of uh, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, I guess it was, and our instructor at the time was uh, Sergeant Al Giese, he was in the National Guard, and so we met out at the fort at our little classes and it was through him then that he got me interested in the Army National Guard. I talked to Army recruiters and this and that and I told my parents about it and they said, hey, go ahead. So I was 17 years old, they had a sign for me and I joined the National Guard 
my 17th junior in high school in 1963. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, lefty. Yeah. Uh, when I turned 18, I had to sign up for the draft. That was the law. You got the draft card. I thought, well, he'll never have another war for a long time. About four and a half years later, the Korean War was going. And uh, that started in June. In July, I got a letter. Go to Butte, get your physical. So I did. And uh, then I waited until they called me. They called me finally in the latter part of October 1st of November of 1950. And I took long as what Glenn was saying about it. I'm going to forget a little bit of this tree. He had it made. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I took my basic training at Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, they were right as soon as we were through with basic training, they were taking people out of our outfit left and right to go to Korea because we were getting our butts kicked over there. And so, uh, but fortunately, I didn't have to go there. And so, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to talk about one thing. I know about Colonel Hub Zepke. I used to listen to him on KGBO when I was in high school. I read about him in the Missoulian when I was in high school. My older brother was in, it, in high school with him. Anyhow, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the atomic bomb. I was picked to go on the atomic bomb test. And uh, down in Nevada, there was 24 of us picked for my outfit because we were operators and we ran equipment and they needed some equipment down there. They thought they needed to drive a truck and all the personnel down there. But Anyhow, I, I never worried much about uh, that one. That morning that I went down there, before I got my truck, I was in my tent, I got out, get some water, milk, canvas, bag, the shade. Here come this three-star general right in front of me. He saluted me with Mark Clark. <laughs> and I said, that was Mark Clark. And I said, he's there, he's not going to sit too far from his lefty. I said, nothing to worry about. So anyhow, I went to Tommy Bombs and got to see that, and that was something to see. And it was covered up for many years. They wouldn't look into it. Many, many people died that was there from radiation and other diseases. I kept up on it. I read on it. I belonged to the Tommy Bomb Association. Anyhow, I, it was kind of a hush-hush of thing. When I first went to turn in a claim, they said, well, you're recording your badge. You didn't take any radiation in. I said, I didn't even have a badge. I said, this first bunch. I was on the first bunch that went in there, I said, we didn't have badges. And they had to admit it, we didn't. But anyhow, I just want to tell you about atomic bomb. It was quite interesting. After they told us to sit down, because if you don't, we'll knock you down. We sat down, hung on to our legs, and then the blast came. It was tremendous. And then we, they told us to stand up, and you could watch it go up in the air. And later on, we went down to what it did to the dead sheep. And Is this in New Mexico? It drove off. Was this in New Mexico, the first Trinity? Pardon? Was this in New Mexico, the Trinity blast? What did you say? I'm not here. In New, New Mexico. Was this in New Mexico? Well, this was in Las Vegas, Nevada. We built Camp Desert Rock. I was on the pioneer of doing that. The mm -hmm. Nevada testing ground. Buster Jangle, uh, the, the one I was on. The big, and there were several dignitaries there. <laughs> so that's all I got to say. I've said enough. <laughs> Thanks, Lefty. Thanks. <laughs> Dave. Well, I was drafted back to like Lefty. You get on the draft. Tom Fleming uh, was the postmaster, and he was on the selective service board. And my dad knew him real well anyway. He calls, he says, Dave's, uh, I think I was nine, had a real good friend in Clinton, his name was Jay Stitt. Yeah. He was, I was nine and ten, or he, I was ten, and he was eleven, because they're birthdays were uh, day apart. And, uh, he said, you, you better have Dave get his ducks in a row or go to school or what he, or I was going to be drafted. So we went down, we both wanted to go in the Air Force, but we ended up joining the uh, Army uh, and went to Butte. And for Butte, they sent us to uh, Louisiana, Fort Polk, went through basic Pagaland there and then over to Fort Belvoir and we went through uh, mechanics, engineering there and then we, there was 25 of us that got chosen for advanced engineering 
And then from there, we had volunteered for Vietnam, uh, both Jay and I. And uh, from there, we ended up, uh, we flew to Seattle. And in Japan, there was about 40 of us called, landed, they had everybody on the plane, there was 40 of us called out. And uh, we got on a different plane. And uh, Young didn't know where we were going. Uh, anyway, they come in and uh, we ended up uh, landing in Seoul, Korea. And uh, I spent part of my time in Korea. Ended up being in the military police over there. And then I uh, was there for about a, just over a year. And then I TT'd out of there to Alaska because I always wanted to go to Alaska. And I stayed in the military, ended up uh, as the head of a, uh, uh, it was on a battery D out of uh, Fairbanks. We got all our supplies from Allison Air Force Base. And then while I was there, the sergeant retired from the engineers, so I transferred back into the engineers because you had two GIs I had under me and six civilians. And the civilians like to fish and hunt, so that worked out very well for me. And that's how I ended the rest of my career out there. Thanks, Dave. Okay, we'll go right on back. Uncle Sam decided I should be in the Army. I was drafted in 51. That's why I was in the Army. They made your decision for which branch you were going. They made they made your decision for you on which branch hey, you were going. <laughs> hey Jim, you was a heck of a cook too, wasn't you? I was. <laughs> All right. Still is. <laughs> yeah, still is. Yeah. <coughs> we got back I uh, got my draft notice, and uh, I was talking to a bunch of other kids that got them, and uh, we all decided to join the Air Force. So that's how I got it. Okay, over on the other side back there. Well, I was a volunteer by way of my little draft boy. <laughs> Stan, I happen to be a fellow mountaineer. I need to talk to you. I, uh, I went through college <laughs> and uh, forced me. So did I. I was working in uh, Northern California at the time of my draft notice. So I entered the service not knowing what I was going to do other than being a foot soldier, but I ended up in counterintelligence. And uh, during the course of my enlistment, I had changed this name to military intelligence. And uh, served my two years, and then went back into uh, with the Forest Service. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. Oh, oh, we missed one. Oh, yeah, I just came down here to see who knows who's left. I left in uh, 38, 39, moved away, but I knew all these kids. Boy, there was a bunch of them. I don't leave with any friends still. Uh, I signed up in high school. Uh, they drafted you. over on this side. We, we can start right up here in the front. I was 4F. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I tried to join the Marines in high school and I was 17. I graduated, I couldn't pass a Marine physical. So I tried to join the Navy and I couldn't pass, pass a Navy physical. So I got married, started to have kids, then the Army says, we're going to draft you. 
So I got that famous bus ride from Missoula to Butte. I think it took us about 10 hours. The bus broke down in Nimrod and they had to send us another bus. We spent overnight in Butte. And then I got my 4F card from there. <laughs> yeah, they're fun ride anyhow. Yeah, I got a good ride. Got, got to see Butte anyway, didn't you? Yeah, free meal, free hotel night. Thank for your time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Hey Frank, you want to take a shot? Huh? You want to take a shot? Okay, I uh, was in high school, and I knew that I was going to get drafted, probably when I got out. Uh, a friend of mine said, well, why don't we go in the Navy? <coughs> because I like uh, boats and ships and things. I thought, oh, that sounds pretty good. Maybe I can get on board one. I couldn't swim. And uh, boot camp, they tried to teach me to swim. And I guess they thought they had taught me, but I didn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I went in the Navy. He uh, got out on a hardship discharge. So I was there by myself as far as that part went. And, uh, but I knew I was going to have to go, you know, in some sort of military. And I thought that was probably the best thing. I, I, uh, I like to have a nice warm bed, you know, grip over my head. It wasn't all that great, but it was, you know, better than where a lot of other people were. Uh, then, uh, I, because I like boats and everything, there's two, uh, the LSP that I was assigned to uh, had two uh, LCVPs. The boats were 16 ton each. But uh, we needed operators, or the ship needed an operator, so I uh, put in for it and I got uh, to operate one of them uh, LCVPs. And uh, so therefore I pretty much got to do what I wanted to do while I was in the service. Cool. That was basically my motivation. Okay, right. we have uh, Lee, you want to go ahead? Yeah. yeah. I uh, was only 18 and I was actually thinking about going into RA, the regular army, and then these two lieutenants from the 154th National Guard come around to the house. And it's Bill Sheridan, he was just in the paper a couple weeks ago for his 50th, and then Stoverud, he passed away three, four years ago. But anyway, these two lieutenants, so I thought, well, this National Guard was a six months active, and I thought it sounds like a good way to go and then if I liked it I could always switch and go to RA from there so uh, an idea was to go in when you're 18 and get it over and get her done you know out of the way and before I signed up I was working seven days a week in this bakery doing funky work so I wanted out of there pretty bad anyway so the <laughs> army was looking better every day I was going to that bakery so <laughs> so it gave me a good out to get out of there you know? All right. Yeah. Good job, Lee. How about Don? Did she tell us about her dad? What? Did she tell your, us about your dad? Your dad was cool. We got to hear about him. <laughs> he was in the Navy. He was Navy, yep. Yeah. Bob Farda. Bob was, from what I remember of Bob, that's that snowmobile thing he made with an airplane. And man, when he put that together and fired that machine up, he went down that back alley between where our history center is and the old vacant lot. He went down there like a stomped on a bunch of cats, roaring down. I don't know what kind of engine he had on that, but it looked like a swap boat and a snowmobile combined. Yeah. Was a but was Bob a, was, was always. A small airplane motor that yeah. he had on that. And he did eventually take that motor and make a welder out of it. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't let anything go to yeah. waste. Well, Bob, I think, was an example of the good times we had here at Water. If there was something to be done that was on the outer edge, Bob was there doing it. He never, he never talked about the war, but he, he was on a, I think, a destroyer. It was yeah, called he was the, on a destroyer. It was called the Denton. Oh. He's got, well, my stepmother has pictures of it. 
so I'll probably get those someday. Yeah, we got to we got to get together and go yes. through that. Yeah, that. Good. Is there uh, when when you were in the service? Was there an individual person uh, that stands out that made a big impact on you? Kind of steered the direction of your life from that point. We can start from this side. Somebody in the service that was a real influence on you? Other, other than your DI? <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can start over here. Was, was there somebody else that was, that was a big influence on you while you were in the service? I know there, was, there were people that... <laughs> That changed my direction while I was in there. Um, no, I just have to say no. I I just uh, usually I got along with people and and I guess I was assigned to some things that didn't come to the rest of the group and I don't know why. So yeah, don't. No. No. <laughs> just <Okay. laughs> one of the bunch. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Is there anybody that remembers an outstanding person in their military that? That guy that made me shave every morning. Yeah. <laughs> I, might, I might have one that's not a person who made an influence, but an incident. Uh, when I was going to intelligence school at Fort Oliver, outside of Baltimore, I was called on my class one day and I called to the G2 for uh, an interview. And there was an agent there waiting for me. And he put in front of me that I had been <clears throat> arrested for peeping Tom while attending the University of West Virginia. And it turned out that there was a student there with a name very similar to mine, yet he happened to be a BMOC, which happens to be a big man on campus. <laughs> He was the uh, student manager of the basketball team. And this was at a time when Hot Rod Hunley and Jeremy West were <laughs> big names back there. So his name was familiar to me. And in the course of our, the interview, I presented this to the agent. <clears throat> and everything was resolved in my favor. Well, I had. Prior to uh, coming into the service, I was working with the Border Service. And just prior to my leaving, they initiated a civil service uh, investigation, background investigation on me. And I never saw the results of those until <clears throat> I was ready to leave the military to come back to the Border Service. And I, it was presented to me that the civil service had developed the same record, which I was then told that I would probably have been immediately released from the Forest Service without any questions. Well, it so happened that I was aware of this through my military experience and through uh, regular routine, I was able to retrieve my this portion of my dossier with the information on it as it had been resolved in my favor. So it so happened I was able to present that back to the uh, civilian, you know, the Department of Agriculture and uh, advise them that yes, I knew about this after the fact that they knew and it had been resolved in my favor. And with all of that, the military helped me get back in my civilian track. Any, anybody, one, one of the things that, that always came up when, when, when I was sitting around with guys talking was one of Jim's favorite things was the, the, the military food. Is there, is there any good stories about the, the military food? I know Jim, Jim made good stuff. There were no complaints yeah, there. Don't mess with Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but any, any good military food stories out there? Preferred recipes for SOS? SOS is my favorite breakfast. 
<laughs> yeah. You'll get your day started and stick with you. Yeah. Well, that's what that's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, I have a question for Elsie. Okay. Elsie, you were in the officer's mess and you had got the crab cakes and all that. What did you get when you got back to your regular? Well, we ate just whatever this what the menu of the day was the same or small. We just ate whatever. And I, oh, navy beans, boy, I love beans today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you said you couldn't make bad beans. I love that so much. Yeah. <laughs> I might say I went to Germany on a navy ship, and uh, I don't know how many was on that ship, but we picked a lot of Air Force people down in Virginia to take to England. And on the way over, the Navy did us in Rotten Hamburg. So everybody on the ship, everybody, got the diarrhea. Yeah. And it was a mess. <laughs> because the Navy had to have an inspection at 10 o'clock every morning with about two or 3,000 people trying to line up. So they had to have that inspection. Oh my goodness. Facilities on board ships was not set up for mass operation. <laughs> so you see why I say Navy food is no good. I know several people followed the Forest Service after they got out of the military. You know, when you, when you went into the military, you went into a lot of us, I know I did. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go in, I'm going to pick up a vocation that I can use when I get out. And salvage diving just never got off the ground around here. <laughs> Anybody else wind up with a, with a rating in the military that really didn't pan out for civilian life? I got one to tell. Uh, the Army Conda Company, who I was working for in the lumber department, uh, they gave me a $300 bonus when I was drafted. And of course, they had to wait till I swore it in and all that. Went stepped forward and got my serial number and all. Then they sent a check to my dad because they didn't know my address. And so dad sent it to me and I signed it, and sent it back to dad and they said, dad, would you please pay my car payment off and plus the bar bill at the Foxwood Tavern. <laughs> <laughs> my mother said that didn't go over too good. <laughs> Let's see, what, uh, what other questions? Anybody got any, any questions they want to field out? Is, we do it kind of free form here. Hey, everyone. Yeah. Elsie said that when she's in San Diego, she went aboard the Hornet when it was being in for repair. And the Hornet is the ship that launched the Doolittle Raiders. No. Not right. No. That's, that's the one they have in the book. No, the first Hornet. She was on the second Hornet. Oh, the second Hornet. The first Hornet yeah. was sunk at the Battle yeah. of Santa Cruz. I was going to say, it had to be shortly before it got sunk. Yeah, but it, it was the second Hornet that she went on, as far, uh, as, far as I know. I don't remember the names of other ships. Yeah. They were all... Yeah, she wouldn't have been on the first one. They were just big. <laughs> well, she could have been on it, but I think it was the second one that they built that she went on. Probably. It was a carrier? It's curious. It's still in. It's still in Bremerton, or excuse me, it's in uh, Alameda. The second Hornets in Alameda is a historic ship, right now. Any any fun boot camp memories? No, the first week was always pure terror. Unforgettable. <laughs> 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 I know we, we had a lot of different schools in, in boot camp. We had fire school where you'd, they had compartments set up where you'd go in and put out fires because when, when you're on board a ship out in the water and that thing's on fire, you don't really have a lot of places to go. <laughs> so we had firefighting school and, and I'm sure all branches had the tear gas training. Oh man. That was. You had to get in there into that room. 
they'd trip off a couple of canisters of tear gas. You had to coach your 11 general orders. I don't, I don't think they have 11 now. <laughs> or they made you uh, quote the national anthem before they let you back out. You know, and, and when you got outside, uh, that's as close to dying as I believe I ever came. Ah, man, that, that tear gas is something else. <laughs> Terrible stuff. They had a Marine Corps gunny sergeant in, in, in our tear gas chamber, and they would issue each one of you a tear gas mask before you went into the chamber. And then just as you get up to the door, you unscrewed the filters off of it and dropped them in the can by the door. <laughs> <laughs> and you would go in there, and, and uh, he'd be sitting over in the corner there, and he, he had kind of a hot plate set up. And he'd drop these tear gas tablets in there. And he would sit there, and I swear him down, his nose never ran, his eyes never blinked, and the rest of us were dying. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> I don't know if you build a tolerance for that one, but he just had fun. And he would pick individuals in the room, we're all standing in there, you know, and you, you, you just want to panic and fly out the door. But uh, he'd stand there and ask you, uh, one of the general orders of the century, how many guys, you all remember your, your service number? And you can recite that off, right off the top of your head at any given time. How many of you can still remember the 11 general orders of the century? Yeah, <laughs> she memorized mine <laughs> and coached me. <laughs> I don't know my social security. But... Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Any other fun tales? There we go. I've got a question for Glenn. Glenn, you mentioned the 1959 prison riot in uh, Deer Lodge. Don't you have a bazooka story in relation? Yeah, in fact, uh, Bill Rhodes. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Lois, you know Bill. He was first sergeant. Now, he was a Marine. And that man was an artist with a rifle. I mean, one of the finest rifle shots I ever saw. So over there, he was chosen to fire that 3-5 into that tower. That was to be the initiator for when we took the prison back. Well, in the assembly of a 3-5, you have uh, two parts of it. You got uh, the front part and the back, and they lock together, kind of like a stovepipe. And then there's a device that's up on your shoulder with this sight right there. These things are fired electrically. The projectiles about that long, about that big around, high explosive. Okay, in the assembly of that tube, one of them was dropped. So if you put a dent in one of them, arm it, take the safety bands off, put it up there to shoot, that missile goes down that tube, catches that dent, and the whole damn thing, and possibly you, is going to go out the window with it. <laughs> so this was weighing on Bill's mind when he was to shoot. He was to shoot into a tower, and if you've ever visited the, the prison over there, the old prison, you'll see this big explosion mark in the side of the tower. That's where that missile, that 3 5 went, because I think Bill... As fine a shot as he was, he could have put that right through them bars and never batted an eye. But I think he was a little nervous. <laughs> we all took turns going there trying to find that dent if we couldn't. And finally, Bill, I think, being a Marine, a little bit gun ho, give me that gall, man, let's get her going here, you know, whooped her up there, fired it, and she caught the end side of the window. But the explosion, a 3-5. Makes a big enough explosion. Those guys inside there decided, no, no, we don't want no more of this crap. You know, let's let's settle this out. So it, it did psychologically make it, I think, make that whole operation a little bit smoother. When, there were some bad incidents. When in General Bo Foster was the commander, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And Pullion got shot in the arm or something. Didn't yeah, Pullion got really shot up bad. Did it? Yeah, yeah right, in the, right in the typical, I shouldn't pick on a second lieutenant, but being as I was uh, an NCO, some of those kids thought they were indestructible coming out of OCS and whatnot. And with that kind of attitude, when it comes to a combat situation, you know, you're in the fire, that should go out the window. With him, it didn't. I got these gold bars, I'm indestructible, let's go. And of course, when he went, 
they decided to stop him real quick and he, he was tore up pretty bad. So that whole thing was, was uh, if they'd had a prison riot like that today, we'd all be in jail. We'd never get out. So, but I don't want to dig into that anymore because that was, I'm coming from Bonner where I like to, you know, I grew up out here. Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, Lefty Pleasant playing baseball. You know, that kind of a background, and then all of a sudden, bam, you're into that. Didn't like that too well. So, but that was the 3-5 story. That, uh, I don't think that was told too much. And if you ever knew Bill, you'd know why he thought he'd be thumping on my melon if he knew I was there mouthing off about how he was reluctant to shoot that. <laughs> so. That was one of my good time experiences. <laughs> any, any other service related funny stories, comical stories? Or well, I know a pretty interesting story that a lot of people might not know about. Uh, when the Indianapolis was sunk in 1945, it just delivered the atomic bomb, I believe, to the Philippines. And then on their return trip, they got torpedoed. And uh, they couldn't call in help because they couldn't get on the radio because it would be intercepted by the Japanese. So they were out there. There wouldn't have been near as many casualties if they had uh, sooner assistance. But they were the ones that survived were in, afloat on the ocean for like seven days, nine days, and the sharks. And it was over 900 casualties. And just by chance, some uh, Allied planes were flying over and spotted some of the survivors and rescued what was left, and probably somewhere in the 300 range that were rescued. But it was uh, it's quite a book if anybody ever wants to look at a really interesting book. So it was so secret is why nobody knew who, where they were because they delivered the bomb to Tinian and they were coming back. It's just too secret to yeah. say anything about it at all. Any other interesting stories, military related? One other thing. Now, Stan, I've given Stan the book. My father in law was in the Army for a while, and uh, also he worked for a consolidated aircraft. And uh, I've given Stan the book that he had. It was, the aircraft yearbook for 1943. It's 600 and some pages long, but it is a real piece of American history that should be read. Uh, it talks about the, our military in 1942 and uh, <clears throat> kind of a little propaganda about how well the Wildcat did against the Japanese Zero and stuff, but. Everybody that knows the Zero was the only reason the Wildcat last because it was armored. But it uh, talks about how they started high school engineering classes for boys and girls in that book to get, and it lists every manufacturer that was manufacturing aircraft parts at that time. Some may be only a little paragraph, some of them are a couple pages of each manufacturer, but it is a Good book, uh, if Stan can let it out and uh, let people read it, it is uh, a real fascinating piece of history. All right, any, any other? Oh. A lot of stories. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to bring up one little thing. I'm, I'm kind of curious how many people in here are, are American Legion members and like would like to join the Legion and, and share their lives with Military. We've got some. We've got some Legion material out here on the table. Uh, if people are interested, you can take it home, read through it, see what they do to help veterans <coughs> with veterans issues and stuff. So, with that, I'll let Tom do the uh, retire. Retire the. Uh, field WMI flag is just a, uh, there's no vocal 
ceremony. I just want to be free to do Last word I heard, there's cake, cookies, coffee, and lots of neat stuff to see out in the right. narthex out there.